And good morning, everybody. I'm sorry that I arrived a, bit, a little bit way late to the, the school. I had some other constraints, so I still don't know you and the, the audience. Um, so I will have an opportunity to meet some of you later on this week. Um, and today we are going to talk about uh, primarily about vision and language as connected to vision. Um, and within vision, the emphasis will be not on low-level image processing, but on what we call uh, visual understanding. And you will, you will see as we go along what I mean by that. It really, we try to see how to extract high-level useful information, understanding the world uh, through images. And I will talk for an hour and a half. I will divide it, most of it, I will try to present sort of the state of the art. What, what can we do today? What we understand what, uh, in this area of high-level visual understanding, the, the state of the art. I will not have time to go into many technical details. What I will try to do is to uh, describe for you some of the main ideas that proved useful in this direction. And then I would like to spend uh, some more informal time at the end on some future directions and areas where I feel that things are more or less completely open. There is a lot of interesting, good work that needs to be done, and basically this is sort of what you should be doing or maybe doing um, next in people who are interested in, uh, 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 in this area. So when we look at an image, we can get immediately sort of very large amount of information and complicated information. You look at an image like this, uh, the, the contrast is not great here, but I, I, I assume that you can still see and understand what's going on here, what happened before, why these people are hanging out on the, uh, on the electric wires and what these people are doing here, um, and so on. Um, and for people who are not dealing with vision, uh, maybe they are not surprised enough. But you know, what we have to do is to start with an image. We have pixels. We have basically electromagnetic radiation, something like this. And this is a digital representation of what a camera delivers to a computer and also what more or less what the retina of our eyes delivers to the brain. And then the task of the computer or the brain or any intelligent system using vision is to say what's in here, who is there, what they're doing, how they're feeling, their goals, intentions, and so on. So it's a tremendous task, and it's really the gap between the input and what we can derive in a fraction of a second is, is staggered. And that's the, the problem we are uh, grappling with. Within this, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, there has been a lot of work in this area, but it focused primarily on sort of a subset of the problems here, mainly things directly involved with understanding objects, looking at single objects or objects embedded in images, but basically focusing on an object and trying to say what the object is, to sort of label the object. And this includes a number of sub-problems. Uh, the main one that people spend most of the, the community spend most of the time on was object classification or categorization. And the task here is to look at a single image, one of these images, and assign sort of a label, de de uh, decide which category of object, which class of object uh, the image belongs to, that these are dogs, cats, trees, and so on. So that's, that's the problem. And the big problem here is, of course, the variability. You look at the class of dogs, there are so many dogs for, from so many different directions and so on, that looking at an image and knowing that it's a, understanding that this is an image of a dog is a, is a very difficult problem. It, in the face of this large variability. <clears throat> a related problem is to not just classify an object, but also recognize an individual object across the variations that the object can, uh, in appearance that the object might have, that all these are the same, the same person, all these are the same type of cars, and so on. Um, so this is a more sort of precise recognition. Uh, in addition, uh, even when dealing with a single object, the problem is more difficult than just producing a label that this is a car, this is an airplane. When we look at an image, we sort of know almost every pixel what uh, it represents. That this is, say, the, the windshield or the door and so on. Uh, so we would like eventually to sort of 
get a complete interpretation of the object in terms of everything that the person might get out of the image. And this is a difficult problem and relatively little progress uh, has been achieved on this. I would mention a little bit about this before. Um, in addition, a major part of the problem is not just being able to produce something that works, but there is a learning issue. We don't want to program each and every class to, uh, by hand how to uh, proceed and how to analyze a particular image, but what we would like to do is to mimic what people can do. We show the system images, or we show people images, and they learn uh, after a while to recognize them. So a typical setup is that you give a, a learning, a vision system, um, training images, uh, typically labeled as belonging to the class or not belonging to the class, so all these are class images and non-class images, and from then on, the, the, the learning system should uh, do the job on its own, should somehow discover all the differences uh, between the class and non-class images and produce some kind of a classifier as, as it does. So the input is images, and the output is a classifier, sort of ready to go and look at new images and produce uh, labels, uh, labels for them. Now, for humans, uh, we need even less. The images are typically not completely uh, label certainly not each and every image. I think if you think about a baby learning to understand the world, we do tell them this is a car, this is a motorcycle, and so on, but we do it uh, sort of sparsely here and there, um, and they can also do things uh, in, in, in a completely unsupervised way. So the unsupervised problem is more difficult, um, and the task that people usually look at is you have, again, the images, the digital image, class and non-class, and you proceed from there and produce the output, which is a classifier. There has been quite a lot of work recently also on the unsupervised classification, but uh, I will not talk about it today. Um, but the, typically, the, uh, the, the success rate, the, the performance in the unsupervised case is more limited. But there has been quite, quite a bit of work on the unsupervised way, and this is a result of some of our own work in which we just give the system a lot of images, but a good fraction of them contained horses, and the task was then to detect horses, and this is in fact the out, these are images that the system did not see before, and without supervision it managed to uh, discover the class of horses. Uh, so some, some progress has been done in the uh, unsupervised case as well. Now, terminology that will come up, and I think it's also, it's not just terminology, it's a conceptual sort of natural divide in the whole stream of doing classification between producing features for classification and then using these features in order to reach a decision and make a classification. And it's, it's a real divide in the sense that, for example, you can use the same features but try them in different classifiers and see which classifier is best, or you can use very often a single classifier like SVM or something, and try it out with different uh, features. So you can sort of mix and match and, and uh, have to decide on the good features for the task, uh, and later on, on the right way, the optimal way of combining, using, deriving the information from the features, um, and produce the final, the final decision. And this has been a main challenge in the field for many, many years. Uh, the, those of you who do not to vision. It's a big field of object recognition. There are, you know, probably tens of thousands, maybe more than that, of papers do, dealing directly with object recognition. So it's something that has been studied a lot, and a large proportion of it for many years has been on looking for uh, good, uh, uh, good features to derive from the image and then use for representation. And features that were proposed over the years range enormously in scope and in type from very simple to very complex uh, uh, ones. In fact, most of them occupied the, the, uh, uh, the low point and the high point of this range. Some of them were very simple, some of them were uh, complex, relatively very little in between. Uh, when I say simple, I mean things like wavelets uh, or Gabor functions. These are sort of mathematical functions that look like sort of like locally, like sine waves or something similar, uh, and you can describe the intensity distribution rather than giving it the intensity. At a pixel, you can look at a neighborhood and use this as sort of basis functions. Uh, at the other extreme, 
a very popular scheme until about uh, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, something was to describe images in terms of higher level three-dimensional primitives, including things like boxes and cylinders and cones and things like that. So you look at an image, you produce a three-dimensional reconstruction, you try to fit the three-dimensional primitives to the image and then look at them and try to describe the image or to uh, uh, classify the object in terms of the collection of the three-dimensional primitives called geons that, uh, that, uh, that you see. And it is, um, in the cognitive science, uh, there were books and articles, and if you look at the earlier uh, uh, review papers, uh, people said that we rough, roughly understand object recognition, at least we know that it's, or at least we, everybody agrees that it's uh, done by going through this kind of representation. But this got stuck, and you will not hear, if you read papers of the last 10 years, you will not hear even the name Geons described. So it was, there was a large transformation in the, uh, in the field, uh, trying to find uh, sort of good features for representation. And the feature that are being used today are sort of variations, all of them on, as you will see, sort of local uh, patches of images, sort of directly looking at pieces of images uh, taken from, typically taken from, uh, from example, for painting images. And the intuition behind that, I think, is, is sound and, and clear, uh, that when you look at the, a visual class is almost defined by uh, being a uh, sort of a co configuration, you, all these images in the same class are similar configurations of some shared components. So if you look, for example, at the, uh, at the class of faces, and I'm not talking about individual face, but just saying here is a face in the image, uh, you can see some sort of, imagine that these are training images, and then you see a new Im image, this is a face you have not seen before, so the face may be, uh, may be new, but typically parts of the image, like the hairline, would be similar to the hairline that you have seen before, and the eyes would be similar to uh, regions of eyes you have seen in other faces. So you can think, if you want to think about it more, more biologically or neuronal terms, you can think of cells in your brain that are, have receptive fields sensitive to the region of the hairline, or the eye, or other parts of the, uh, of the face. And then when a new phase comes up, these neurons will be, many of them will be activated and the collected activation of these uh, feature detectors will be a good uh, signature that you uh, again encounter uh, a phase in image. Uh, now if you go along this direction, the interesting question that comes up is what are the natural building blocks uh, for a new category? So if I give you, for example, a collection of horses, uh, what would be a good way of describing a horse in general and the entire class of horses in terms of the appearance of local uh, image feature? If you think about it, we can take from the image, this may be parts of training images, again, the case of faces, we can take different sort of pictures or fragments of faces, bigger ones, or smaller ones. Not all of them are expected to be equally good. Uh, let me turn the question to you. If you take sort of a large part, maybe a full face or half a face or three quarters, is this, a, is this likely to be a good feature for detecting new faces in general or not an optimal feature? Any, any ideas on that? Not optimal. Non-optimal because? It doesn't seem like you would generalize. That's right. The problem will be generalization. I mean, this is a very distinct feature. If you see this in the image, you're probably looking at a face, on a face but the probability of seeing something like this in a new face is, of course, low. Uh, what about, since you started, what about a very small feature? Like a piece of an eyebrow may appear in many, many faces, if not all of them. Would, be, would this be a much better feature? Any other thoughts or? Did you see some of the things in other? In one case. Exactly. This is going too much in the other direction because a small feature like this you're likely to see in, you know, plants and in uh, just general texture and so on. So intuitively you would think that optimal features for build, building blocks, sort of an alphabet for a new class, would be something intermediate between the two. And you can formalize this uh, that you're looking for a feature that will be highly informative for the class. It will deliver to you as much information as possible 
about the class. Yeah. So it, it seems clear that the small, that very small features aren't very diagnostic um, when, when they're, they're the only feature. But it's not clear to me that like, like configurations of such features aren't wouldn't necessarily right. But a single one at least will not be in some sense right. And you're trying to look for features. And this this is maybe even a part of the I think the insight or the in some sense the. the Pixels themselves are already carrying all the information. The configuration of the pixels is carrying all the information. Uh, and in fact, by mathematical theory, you cannot, by looking at some configurations of pixels and so on, you, you never increase the information. So it's not more, the collection is not more informative, but then you have an enormous task of dealing with this. And you want to meet the problem sort of how, halfway and say, let's look for features that individually will be highly informative and then and then combine this this I agree that this is not the only possible way of seeing uh, thinking about it, but since configuration configuration of pixels proved in, impossible to use as configuration, it made sense to let start to sift the information out by highly informative features, and then we'll have a small number of highly informative features combine them and in fact, this proved to be uh, very good. And I will not go into the details of sort of information theory and so on. I will assume that most people know roughly what information is and what mutual information, how you compute, how you deal with this information. If not, uh, uh, I just not have time to do it now. I'll be glad to explain it to people individually. But for those of you who know roughly what information is, that you can compute information between two variables, you can look at an image, a set of images, basically as a random variable, which is one for a class image and zero otherwise. Similarly, for a feature, you can think as a, as a binary variable, which is one if the uh, feature is present in the image and zero otherwise. So if you have, say, 200 training images associated with this, um, for any potential candidate feature, you have its uh, sort of signature, what kind of variable it is, and you can see how informative it is, how much information it delivers, uh, for the classification task. And this is the mathematical formula, but it's intuitively, you basically look for a feature that will, co will be highly correlated with this. It will have ones when the image is really a horse and zero otherwise. But it turns out that, that you don't want to do correlation, but uh, in fact measuring the information is better because you can show mathematically that this will reduce the classification error, and I will not go into that. Um, and you can do it now automatically and mechanically. Suppose that you had class images, 200 faces, and say some, numbers of, some number of images which are non-faces, and the question is what's a really great feature? What will be if you needed a single feature to decide based on just this one feature whether there is a face in the image or, a face in the image or not, what will be the feature? It turns out you can solve this at least for the data given by looking at all the possible sub-images, for each one of them, each candidate feature like this, like this, you can look how often it appears in the uh, class set and how often it appears in the non-class set. From this, you can plug it directly into a measure of information and you can find sort of the best or the second best or the K best features uh, for, uh, uh, for finding faces in the images. Uh, you have to deal with the redundancy. You don't want features that look uh, sort of the copies of uh, one another. I will not get into this uh, dealing with this redundancy, but the general idea is that you look for patches which uh, tell you as much as, you, as, as possible about the presence of a face or a class uh, in the image. And as we expect from the sort of intuitive uh, argument before, you get localized local image appearances, local image regions. Now, sometimes you get low resolution, large images. Sometimes they're smaller, sometimes they're slightly bigger. But you get sort of typical um, sub-regions of classes, uh, which uh, turn, to, turn out to be the most informative features for uh, finding classes. And from, based on this consideration, either directly or indirectly, all the systems in existence now basically try to describe images or class images by dividing them into localized parts and the parts are not necessarily parts in the semantic sense that it, it has to be an eye or it has to be a nose for a face or it has to be uh, say 
exactly the head of the horse in the case of the hood. You get pages of this, uh, of this general appearance, uh, which each one of them turns out to be formative, useful, and a collection of these uh, localized features um, can be used very successfully for discovering new members of the class that you have not seen before. This is typically combined with some, at least uh, some degree, of relative position information, because if you look for, a, say, a horse, you would like the, uh, uh, the head to be relatively high, the legs to be uh, 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 below it, and so on. So you can produce, based on learning, a, a representation which tells you what are the main features and what is the relative arrangement in space of these features. Uh, and this is the kind of configuration that becomes the object representation. When you look at a new image and you want to see if there is a horse there, you basically look for uh, a configuration, this arrangement of uh, localized parts, which you have, de have derived during, uh, during learning. So a typical algorithm will look for, look for each of the parts individually. For each part, it produces sort of a vote where the center of the object should be, if there is some kind of so the star configuration of various features relative to a central location. Um, and if this measure is high enough, uh, it's typically sufficient for representation. So uh, people do not necessarily use directly measuring, uh, deriving the mutual information of each feature, but the common aspect of existing schemes is they're all, use, all using the same family of uh, features, deriving them either the in this direct way or somewhat indirectly by trying uh, different features individually and see if they help classification or not. There are various ways of doing it. And some people just know that if you take intermediate features, if you take an object which is, uh, I don't know, 150 pixels on the side and you build parts which are 30 pixels on the side, you're, you're roughly correct and you can proceed with that. There has been very rapid progress in this uh, area start, when people started to use sort of more sophisticated models and classifiers uh, based on features like this. I'm bringing this, this was taken from a paper that was written circa 2004 or three or something when the work of classification started to take off. And this was described as something that computers will not be able to do in the near future. People showed it in the paper and said, <clears throat> Here are different airplanes. How on earth can you learn to automatically to discover and recognize that all these things are all airplanes? And roughly al already in the same year, people produced systems that without seeing these images, classified all of them as, as airplanes. So there was, it's interesting because you don't see it many, very often in computational uh, theories of cognition and so on, that you have such a rapid transition from problem that you say this will not be solved to producing workable solutions within the span of a couple of years. Um, a related and important question that uh, comes along with this is how to measure the similarity between, say, a feature and an image, or how you represent the image. Do not, you do not necessarily do it on the basis of pixels, and it turned out that uh, this is by trial and error, but um, a very good way of representing locally the image and comparing whether a new page that you see is similar or not sufficiently similar uh, to a part of the image is by using the local gradients and some combination of those. And if you read the literature, you will see two terms. One, is, one of them is called SIFT and the other one is called HOG. HOG is histogram of uh, oriented gradients or something like this, but people already treat them as words in the English language, SIFT and HOG, and are doing a very similar thing, which I think, again, it's very intuitive, and uh, you can get a lot, I think, by just using some healthy intuition and then formalize it. It turns out, and people knew it in biology for a long time since the work of Jubel and Wiesel, that what's important in images is not the intensity values, that it's now 117, because this can change with the light. Uh, the ambient light, but the, the edges and gradients in the image, the boundaries, the, the orientation of the boundaries, that's important. So you want to represent the local region by the direction of the local edges if they exist. And then in order to allow some flexibility and distortion in images, you cannot expect 
when you see a similar image again, that edges will be at exactly the same position that they were before. So you want to allow some slope and some uh, uh, position tolerance in uh, where you expect to see an edge that you've seen before. So an intuitive and plausible way of doing it is that you produce local descriptors in which you look for the local orientations, and then you allow them to move a little bit and say, I want, I'm looking for this edge roughly at this location. And this is what the whole description is, uh, is doing and all the other useful descriptors. They look for the local edge direction, the gradient directions. They produce a local histogram that doesn't care about the very precise location uh, of these edges. And a vector describing uh, sort of concatenates together this local histogram is the Hope descriptor, and this is the way uh, images are, are compared. Uh, this local descriptors, the patches are being compared. Uh, uh, in most of the uh, uh, computational scheme, this is, for example, from a real paper described, showing how a system describes uh, bicycles, for example, and these are the local orientations at each uh, location in the image. Uh, this is then divided into parts, as I described before. Uh, so local parts described by, described by these uh, uh, rough local orientations uh, proved to do the uh, uh, to do the job as best as we can, and this produced also an interesting convergence between biology and computation. Because while people were busy doing the computational theories, uh, uh, biological modeling, in particular HMAX scheme that uh, Tommy and, and his group developed, um, used a more directly biological way of modeling object recognition, but if you look at the kind of descriptors and the kind of way things combine in order to do classification, they are very similar to the kind of uh, schemes that people working uh, on computational algorithms, and many of them without knowing much about the biology, in fact, produce this way. Maybe you heard already a description about HMAX, but again, it starts with local orientation, it then lets them move a little bit and produce a local descriptor that looks for uh, an orientation within a local region. These are combined in the same way that the Hope descriptor would be combined. So the, the, there is a really natural map between uh, some of the most successful computational scheme being employed today and, uh, and uh, HMAX and similar models that try to explain and use uh, the uh, uh, the, the architecture of the, uh, of, of the human and the primate uh, object recognition system, and maybe here, using the biology, you can also get some plausible estimates of uh, how large the receptive field should be and so on. So it's an interesting uh, convergence between, uh, between the two. Let me show you quickly a sort of state of the art, where we are, what, what, are, what is the rough level of performance these days, uh, and it's also interesting to, to mention the way this uh, field, sort of the sociology of this field, the way it operates, is that our yearly competition, until recently the, the main one was the so-called Pascal Challenge, uh, in which sort of central site puts out challenges like, let's see who is the best in the world in recognizing airplanes, and they give you data set of airplanes, some of them are kept secretly, you cannot use them, but you can train your system on the images you, you've been given. And then at the end of the year, when the time is up to, to do the competition, you submit your algorithm, and then people run the algorithm on the uh, test set and produce curves and see whose curve is the best. Uh, and then they publish the results, and I think they get the $100 prize for uh, being successful, uh, they put it on their CV, and it's a, it's, a, it's a nice thing to it. And it produced a huge barrage of activity. Many people are submitting uh, entries to this competition. Uh, you can see here various curves. The highest, the better, so you can see that somewhere here are the winners. Uh, and you can see the range of images that you have to treat with. So, to treat. Uh, so these are different images from the test set. And you can see that they are very, very different from one another. So the system that uh, uh, has to learn that the, the system in the, in the competition or the classifier needs to be able to deal uh, with this large variability in appearance. 
Uh, these are also labels. I will not go through the labels, but by places and, and, and year and so on, you can see there has been a nice progression that systems initially, many of the systems were not that good, uh, and over the years we are getting better and better. So there is something interesting, and maybe it's, uh, we discussed it yesterday, maybe something like this will, will be useful for other areas of computational cognitive science. It generates some, if you do it correctly, it generates some healthy competition. Some, yeah. Where's the human performance curve there? Sorry? Where's the human performance curve? Better. Uh, the human performance would be close to here on this curve, 100% of perfect is this corner. People will be, they, they, may miss one, they may miss one or two. Some of them are so difficult that you may miss them. So it will not be 100, but they will be 99 or something like that. So will be, they will be better. And it's an interesting question, which uh, I will mention a little bit at the end. If we continue with this competition, are we going to push, push this from here to here, to human level, or are we stuck here? There is an indication maybe of some asymptote here, and I think there is an asymptote, and there is a real gap which is not going to be solved by the current method. But so that's, uh, that's an interesting and important part. And a continuation of this, some classes are still not as good as, as others. So this, in the meantime, became even somewhat better, but some classes are the gap between human performance and uh, uh, computer vision is, is higher and it's interesting to inspect which one uh, came closer to human uh, performance and which one or not. You can see in numbers that the average precision sort of airplane is 53, but some other things are plant, just looking and saying this is a plant in the image, it is much lower, so there's still way to go in terms of this. Let me mention quickly as we uh, uh, describe this system. There has been a lot of buzz recently, which is an interesting buzz on the use of so-called deep learning and convolutional neural networks to do object classification. So in the last few years, couple of years, in fact, the winners of some of these competitions, the Pascal and similar competitions, uh, were systems that come under the general label of this uh, deep learning and convolutional neural networks. How many of you have not heard the name deep learning, the general press, and so on? So, right, so that shows something. You don't, very often, uh, I don't think that if you look, at the general public didn't hear the name Hawk or, or SIF descriptors, but they did hear, I think, the term deep learning was all over the place in the uh, general uh, uh, press and so on. Uh, uh, so, also, he produced the, the Google bought uh, Jeffrey Hinton and his kind of operation, and then Facebook bought Jan de Kuhn from NYU and his operation. So, it also spilled over from the more academic field sphere to, uh, to the big companies, and they're all trying now to uh, uh, solve some intelligent tasks they're trying to do. Um, using deep learning. And I think I do not have time. I think that's just by itself is maybe an interesting evening discussion. So, uh, which part of these paths are real, where the problems still lie, <clears throat> and so on. But let me give you just some examples of what it produces in the field of object recognition. Uh, <clears throat> the big sort of breakthrough <coughs> uh, for deep learning in, in, in recognition and in, in vision uh, was very recent in 2012. It won sort of by a large margin one of the biggest competition in vision classification in an interesting competition that was probably a part of the uh, uh, why it captured the attention. Um, <clears throat> uh, in trying to do object classification, uh, people moved from a small number of classes to increasingly larger and larger number of classes to recognize. So you're given an image, and the question is not, is this a bike, yes or no, but here is a uh, list of possible categories. Tell us which one in the list. Uh, show us a location and tell us uh, uh, about the object in the, at, the, at this location, uh, which object in the list of possible objects it uh, belongs to. And it started with maybe 100 categories or so, then for several years, uh, the main 
competition was on the database from Caltech using 256 images. And then it jumped to the recent one was, I think, if I remember the number correctly, is 15,000. Is this the number? Uh, in a collection called uh, ImageNet. Uh, right, you can see the ImageNet here. So there was an ImageNet competition in which uh, Fei Fei Li and other people at Stanford collected laboriously using the mechanical third, uh, uh, labeled images uh, for 15,000 categories and, and several thousand images in each category. So this is a database of uh, uh, many million annotated images. Uh, and again, you can do a competition by revealing a half of the database to uh, people who want to develop classifiers. They develop the classifiers, and then the images are being tested on the other ones uh, to see if they recognize all 15,000 categories. Maybe the competition here was slightly, maybe 10,000, but that's a rough number. It's a very large number of different, uh, different classes. Some of them are very similar to each other. It's a big, uh, it's a, it's a big challenge. And then you do not see these curves, which are uh, uh, relatively high up. It's very difficult to get uh, good average results in such a complicated task. And uh, so this was one of the tasks uh, uh, <coughs> that people competed in and, and took, started to take more and more seriously. And, and then a family of algorithms uh, started by, as I said, Various people, but including uh, Jeff Hinton, was the one I think termed, uh, coined the term deep learning. Uh, these classifiers were composed of a system of many layers, not just the two or three layers, but uh, <laughs> many layers, in which you try to automatically discover a whole family of features, starting from very simple ones and then to more complex ones, more complex ones, until you get to the very top. And to the very top, uh, uh, one of these nodes will light up, uh, uh, this node will correspond to one of the categories you want to, uh, to recognize. And in fact, people who know the literature uh, from, from, late, from the 80s, going back to the 80s, this is very similar to multi-level, multi-layer perceptron, to the kind of connections, networks that people uh, used and developed during these days. It's very similar conceptually. It's with bigger computers, larger computers, faster computers, and a few additional tricks, but not very many. It's basically uh, a revival of a method that uh, uh, the revival was based not on a conceptual breakthrough, as far as I can see, but on using the same methods, but uh, bigger and faster and, and stronger. Uh, I will not go into the description of uh, a real description of how a system works, but maybe get some numbers here. I don't see it. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, it's typically a huge number of parameters in this network, and it's usually a repetition. Uh, basically, what you do is it turns out that there is a standard architecture for this by now, for the deep networks, that it's repetition of three operations, that you do some linear convolution, you have sort of filters, and filters mean, for those who are not, not versed in the terms, it's just a linear combination uh, of pixels in a region, so that's a linear operation. Then you perform some nonlinearity. You, you have, for example, a page which represents an eye, you convolve the image with an eye page, then you set a threshold to see if it's above a certain threshold, uh, and then you do some pooling within a neighborhood and you go up to the next layer. In the next layer you do, uh, again, apply to the input of the previous layer, you do some linear, uh, uh, linear summation, uh, a non-linearity, uh, pooling over some space, then you repeat. Uh, so it's a huge network that does these repeated operations, but you have to decide on the nature, the weights of all uh, the parameters, uh, uh, which can be millions and millions of, uh, of parameters. You have to optimize them. You optimize them basically by gradient descent of some sort, you initialize them and you start to change them uh, in a way that will uh, improve the performance uh, uh, until you stop when it asymptotes or when you run out of time. Um, now, 
in 2012, this deep network uh, achieved 16% uh, error, maybe 84% uh, average correct result. And the second runner-up was 26% uh, error. These numbers were very impressive, and people who are doing these competitions are looking at these numbers and are impressed by these numbers. And typically, the gradual uh, progression was very small, 1%, 1.5%, 0.8%. So suddenly having a competition in which the gap between number one and number two was so large uh, in the community made a big splash. Uh, and uh, people saw that as a, as a very big advance. And indeed, in practical terms, it did produce results which were better than, than the other ones. I should mention, the, just because it, the task is very difficult, one way of pushing the numbers up was instead of looking at the percent correct, they looked at the percent correct within the top five suggestions. So the network is allowed to produce not one answer, but five, and if one, if one of them is correct, uh, that's considered okay. So when they say 84% correct, it means that uh, within the, first, the top, the top uh, five proposals. It's interesting, I think, what I find interesting is also to look at when you have this network of multiple features that were learned simply by some gradient descent of huge network, you can have a look at the different nodes within the network. And this is maybe an interesting general point. It's because some people say that you produce these huge networks by huge optimization. You don't really understand what's going on. So in what sense did you produce science, even if the percent correct is uh, impressive. I think one advantage is that, unlike the brain, uh, you can easily uh, poke each one of the nodes and take away each one of the pieces of the network. And if it works well, uh, you could investigate it more and more and get uh, uh, an understanding of what's going on inside the system more than you can. Uh, in a biological system. And you can look at different levels within this deep learning network and look at the nodes, sort of the sort of artificial neurons that is within this network and see what are the receptive fields, what they like, what they respond optimally to, optimally to. And when you look at the low level layers in this multi-level architecture, they respond as perhaps not surprising, but it's interesting to look what they respond to. They respond to sort of local features, edges, uniform uh, regions, uh, maybe some bars of different orientation, so the kind of thing we find in V1, uh, maybe V2 of the primate. Uh, this is layer three uh, uh, of one of these networks, and each, I should have said, each three by three sub-matrix here shows the strongest uh, the stimuli that activated a particular neuron or node in this, uh, in, in this network. So this three by three bluish corner here uh, are the optimal stimuli for uh, activating one of the nodes in layer three of this network. And you can look, you can see, it may be difficult for where you are standing. They're not exactly objects, but you have sort of a dark shaded object over uniform area. It's sort of intermediate uh, uh, features more complex than, than, than just line, so but less than object. Uh, this is layer five out of uh, nine, and you can see that you get here flower-like uh, stimuli, various other things. So there is a systematic progression in the uh, complexity and also in some sense in the semantic value. They become more recognizable and more object-like. Um, I should mention briefly some of the a big limitation, or one thing that didn't work out. If people tried hard but didn't work uh, well in this kind of network, at least in my view, it didn't work well. Um, and this is doing this in an unsupervised way. Initially, when the whole field of deep learning or subfield of deep learning emerged, by, by when Hinton started it and worked very hard on it, it was supposed to be a a model of the brain uh, being able to learn about the world around us in an unsupervised way. Build this deep network uh, with all these parameters you have to tune, then you turn it to the world and start collecting images, and you hope that uh, the high-level nodes of this system in some unsupervised way 
we learn to discover repeating interesting structures in the world, and in this sense, we learn about objects uh, around you without going laboriously and giving them training images labeled uh, millions and millions of train, training images which are labeled. And people try to do it in an unsupervised way. Uh, this is one example of a large scale attempt of building one of these networks, uh, feeding it lots and lots of data and seeing just by, just by uh, 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 some internal optimization, you will start to discover semantic categories. Uh, so this is, the, it is, it was an effort combined between uh, Stanford University and Google. They did it in 2012. Uh, you can see here some of the numbers just to see what's involved in typical networks like this. It had one billion parameters, this network, a billion parameters you have to set. They trained it with images from 10 million uh, YouTube uh, videos. They used in parallel, they trained 1,000 machines, a total of 16,000 calls over three days running. So this is the training, and the question is what it will learn after uh, such tremendous uh, Train. It learned about faces, so you didn't tell it about faces, and it turned out that one of the nodes in the network, or some of them, responded specifically to faces. So somehow the network learned about faces. It also learned about two other things after all of this effort. Uh, maybe the images are not doing justice to the, uh, to the, they're not great, but they're real images taken from the system. It discovered uh, uh, also faces of cats, not only in human beings, and it discovered the rough outline of the human body. So these are the three things that it discovered well above chance, uh, nothing really more than that. Uh, this was described, in, again, in the open literature in the, in the New York Times and other places, a big success. They tell you Google can learn about discover cats and uh, can learn about objects without being taught. But if you look at the size of the effort and the fact that it discovered these structures, and by the way, it's not cats is not arbitrary, so I understand. Do you have any guess why cats are discovered uh, not other things? Cats are extremely popular. Right. It turns out that the number two object that appears in the, the, the most popular object in YouTube is faces, people. The number, the second one is, is cats. So basically, something is really highly repeatable and it just appears over and over again. Uh, this was able to pick it up. But all the subtle things that we pick up and infants pick up after a few exposures and so on, I mean, the, the gap is so huge uh, that I would call it basically a failure that these networks or these architectures as we understand them now uh, cannot even begin to mimic to explain how we discover things in an unsupervised manner. Um, we're interested here not in machines, but in brains and in cognition. Uh, so an interesting part is to relate uh, various aspects of emerging concepts and theories from computational uh, vision compared to the brain. Uh, let me show you very quickly some examples of our own work uh, combining, collaborating with fMRI and uh, EEG in this case, trying to relate some of the findings from uh, computational vision uh, to the brain. In this case, the question was whether uh, higher level regions in the brain, sort of object-related areas in the brain, are also sensitive to local, uh, highly informative pieces of, uh, of images. And this is a was a challenging question because we still don't know, and even after this study, we know only in a very limited way, what higher area, what are the features that drive higher level uh, areas in the visual cortex. So we know about V1, we know that you have to drive it with certain orientations and direction of motion. Uh, if you have to predict which visual feature would be very good at driving uh, area LOC, for example, which is a, an object recognition area in the visual cortex, it's very difficult. If I give you two images and I ask you, can you guess which feature will be better at activating LOC, this was not uh, uh, a question that uh, people could answer, and the natural thing to try was to measure uh, how informative different uh, local regions are for the purpose of recognition and see whether this 
objective measure of uh, information for recognition can predict the activation of higher level visual areas in the brain. So here's an example of one experiment among the different configurations and different variations. But here you can see an uh, example of a stimuli given to people within an MRI machine. Um, and the contrast was between more informative and less informative features. So in one array, you have a collection of features that if you measure uh, mathematically, they are more informative than the uh, pages here. And you try to correlate the response of different brain regions with the measure of information. And let me show you the kind of results you get. Uh, maybe show you these are different brain areas in different categories. So the uh, experiment involved faces, horses, and car images. Uh, at least this is what's shown here. And for each one of them, you can look at the uh, patches or these regions which are more or less informative. And then you can see, you have, for example, I don't know, a neck of a horse and the legs of the horse. And you want to say which one will activate LOC more. Uh, and look at it, you really don't know. But if you measure it, you find that, for example, the neck is 50% more informative than the legs, and you can try to see it. And the bottom line is that there is a high correlation between the measure of, of objective measure of informa inform informativeness or information for cat categorization uh, and the activity in higher level visual areas. And importantly, you do not see it in low level visual areas. So when you look at V1, these features which are being compared are identical, they're equivalent. So in terms of local edges, contrast, energy uh, in the image are uh, well counterbalanced and they uh, you cannot distinguish it. You can see here, for example, the horse, the more informative and the less informative, uh, the identical. When you go to LOC, there is a big, relatively big and significant difference between the more informative and the less informative ones. Uh, similarly, I found this relatively impressive. For uh, This is an EEG study in which images were just randomly, you took random patches from the same categories, measure the uh, amount of information for recognition and divide, we divided them into five bins from the most informative to the least informative, they've been one to five, uh, five being the most informative. And then we look at, yeah. I have a question about the, uh, did you have any particular task for your subjects when you presented the uh, the, in, the, in the MRI? You can look, we tried both, just passive looking was one. Recognizing was another one. In doing a one-back uh, uh, identification, is it the same as the one you saw before? And we got the same results in all in all of these conditions. So in these conditions, in LOC, uh, the graphs look, look very similar. These conditions. Uh, so I'm curious about. I know that you define how informative a feature is from a mathematical perspective, but I wonder if that corresponds to the intuition that we as observers. Uh, it could be. There's a mismatch. What if you reanalyze your data according to the received information that people report? We we can discuss this. We ask also people to uh, to categorize them, and we got some intermediate results. Not that good. People were sometimes. Basically, basically, if you ask them, by the way, which one you think is more representative or worse, you don't get very good results. Uh, but one of them is more informative than another, nevertheless, and when you try the machine, one is more. So I can show you and give you the reference, many of these controls, at least what was tried, there are more controls, and you can, you can talk about this. These are good questions, I, I agree. Um, you can see here that this one, here I think, anyway, it's, it's a similar study, but here the, the, they were divided into five bins. Uh, we looked at a particular wave in the EEG, which is known to be uh, correlated this classification and sort of the size of the peak pointing downwards is, is the magnitude of the brain response. And you can see that they are ordered very nicely that the most informative is the strongest. This is bin number five, bin, bin number four, three, two, and one are really ordered very nicely. There was very good correlation between the objective amount of information and, uh, uh, and brain response. Let me skip over that and just mention that 
a half open question, but not completely open question, is to produce not just label of the object, but to produce a full interpretation of the object. So if you look at the face, you want to, when you are done, you want to be able to say that this is a face, but this pixel belongs to the eyebrow, and this belongs to the nose, and this belongs to the upper lip, and so on. So we would like to train uh, to look at images, any faces, and eventually uh, have a result, have an output which produces what is termed full interpretation rather than a label uh, for the class. Um, and this was done, this is again from, from our work, and it's done in an unsupervised way, except for labeling uh, uh, class versus non-class objects or faces versus non-faces. Non so uh, there were no labels of the eyebrow, lips, and so on. Uh, the basic idea is that in the same way that you can decompose an image into uh, its useful component, its most informative component, you can take patches like this and subdivide it, divide them into their own informative subcomponents and repeat this until you basically get no gain in information by repeating this process. So there is a relatively simple mathematical procedure that will decompose the patch into its sub-patches based not on semantic labels, but on measures of uh, how to do it in the most informative way. In fact, it's exactly the same algorithm, a repetition of the same algorithm uh, that decomposes objects into and discover patches, informative patches uh, or local regions, the same algorithm can be used uh, to decompose uh, the uh, images of patches into their own components. And then you get hierarchical representations that look like this, which you think are more biological, biologically plausible. You know that the representation in the, the world is, is in, the, in the brain is, is hierarchical this way. Uh, and when you do this, um, you gain somewhat in uh, classification performance, but perhaps more importantly, uh, you gain in the sense that you can uh, produce much more, much richer description than just labeling the objects. You can find uh, the various parts and subparts. And then the representation looks something like this. So this is how the presentation of an object, the class of object, uh, looks in these models or may look in the brain. It becomes very similar to what um, the, the previous work that Tommy has done previously based on biological modeling, again, it's part of the convergence that I described, uh, described earlier, that you get this kind of hierarchical representation. Mathematically, the way that uh, this, you describe it in computational terms, those who are interested in, in the terms, these are probabilistic models in which you describe, you have a node here for the class, and then you describe the probability of the children of this higher node given the presence of the, of the parent, and then you proceed hierarchically you have to measure the conditional probabilities of, say, node x5, x1. So uh, we cannot see at the bottom for some reason. But the full mathematical description is this. You describe the probability uh, of this particular configuration in terms of the uh, class, the uh, uh, main parts and the subparts. Uh, this becomes a product of all the, uh, uh, of the pairwise uh, uh, arcs in this node, namely of the probability of the class times the probability uh, of the children given the class times the probability of each one of each of the nodes given the parent. Uh, and the nice thing about this, and that's the only thing I would say about this kind of presentation, is uh, that it's very efficient to do inference and find the full representation, the full interpretation of an image given this mode. Um, so the problem you are faced with is when you try to find all the parts of, of, of an object given a model like this, is that you are given just an image and you try to find the best assignment of which parts appear in the image at what, loca what location based on this probabilistic mode. It turns out that you can get the globally optimal solution using just a single cycle of going of top bottom up and top down uh, streams of processing. So you start with the image with feature detection in the image. You have to go up and find what's the probability of these guys and what's the sort of activation of probability of the higher level and so on, all the way to the top. 
you get a decision at the top, following the decision of the top, you update the probabilities going down, and you can show mathematically that a single cycle through such a model is guaranteed to give you the globally op the optimal assignment of the features and the locations based on uh, features present in the image. So it's an, uh, unlike the initial uh, recognition in which you only want to know if the object is there, yes or no, in the image, if you want to also produce the full, uh, uh, the most reliable interpretation of the full image, it turns out that you need also the uh, top-down phase and that a single one in this tree-like architecture is enough. You have to go once up, once down, and you're done. You cannot improve it further by doing additional cycles and iteration to the structure. Yeah. So in the top down, you combine the probabilities that you got from the bottom up, and then you combine with the top down. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. And then how do you set these probabilities? You have to learn this probability during training. So you have 100 or 200 images, and based on the images, like, you know, it, it becomes a bit technical, but basically you have to f find this... Uh, uh, features in the image, and you have to estimate the probabilities, and uh, that's a part of the training. So the training is somewhat lengthy, but you can do it and conscious and find the probabilities. The actual recognition, including the full interpretation, is relatively fast because it's a single site. It's a PNAS paper from 2008. I can give them all the technical details to you can look. And it really does a good job that you can look at images like this. You see here that the how parts are interesting. You know, you look at this, you know where the eyes are or the mouth, but each one of these parts, when you look at it individually, it's sort of meaningless. You have to understand and find and detect the parts really within the configuration of the larger uh, structure. It's impossible to do it uh, in many situations based on the feed-forward uh, limited information uh, uh, the full interpretation does it correctly. So you can find the various parts of the face, uh, even though they are locally very difficult and ambiguous uh, by the full cycle of going all the way up to the face and then propagating information uh, down. Uh, for example, the bridge of the nose is labeled in each one of these images. This is one of these red rectangles. It's labeled correctly, it's found correctly, there is no way that you can find the bridge of the nose by building the bridge of a nose detector, but with the full uh, bottom up, top down, it works. Final thing that I wanted, I think that's the final thing that I wanted to say about vision, and then a few words about challenges, open things, things that we cannot do. Uh, what humans can do in images and machines find still difficult is to do full segmentation. When we see an image, we know that this is a horse, that this is a horse, but it's not just the label and even not just sort of where the head is or where the legs are, but we can really delineate, sort of, we can draw a boundary around this object. We know what belongs, which pixels, which part of, the, which region in the image belongs to the object, which does not. This is called segmentation. It's a very tough uh, problem. And people treated it primarily by looking at image properties. Uh, this is sort of the bottom-up approach in which you look at semi-uniform regions uh, and aggregate pixels that belong to semi-uniform regions into, into regions. Like in this horse, you'll end up uh, having a number of regions, for example, the white one, some the brown ones, uh, and so on. So there are sophisticated ways of doing bottom-up image segmentation that we divide the image up into a small number of regions, and then you can try to do recognition based on, on this region because it is one, one for combined segmentation and recognition in some way. And you can see some results here of the best uh, uh, segmentation algorithms, uh, in particular something based on an elegant mathematical algorithm called graph cuts, which was developed by Berkeley, by Mali, used um, widely now, even in PowerPoint, you have a button in which you can do image segmentation, and it's basically using a variation of this, uh, of this algorithm. Now, we know that segmentation also depends a lot, very often, on sort of more semantic, top-down information, top-down 
top down information. How many of you have not seen this image before? This is a popular image. Oh, quite a few. Okay, for, for, for those of you who have not seen this image before, how many of you still cannot see what this image is? Please don't be shy, raise your Okay, almost all of those who haven't seen it before. This is an image of a cow, a cow's head, and we can see here an image of the cow head, and these are two line drawings produced by people who were asked just draw what you see. And some people produce something like this, and some people produce something like this. Obviously, these are the people who saw the head, these are the people who did not see the head. Just to help you, here is sort of top-down information in vision. Uh, let me start with this point here, the top of the ear. Um, it's here in the image, the ear is like this. The, then the mouse is snout is going down like here, going up here. And here is the top of the ruffle. I don't know how many people can now see the cow that they've not seen before. This was not a great description. Just a couple. Okay, so you can look at it. Uh, so these are difficult images, but as you can see, it's sort of a good way of showing that sometimes you really know there is no way that you can segment this image correctly or to an object and background without knowing about cows. And this is to this to, to this extent, this is particularly difficult, but the fact that very often you have to combine it with object knowledge is true in general. And here is a very simple way of doing now sort of bottom up putting do bottom top down semantic information to complement uh, the processes of uh, uh, image segmentation. Um, I say that you can do segmentation, you can do recognition by uh, having object components, object parts, um, which you look for when you try to recognize the image. So if you recognize the image, you basically tile the image with these components that you store in your memory and look for when you do object recognition. So imagine for a minute that for the um, these components in your uh, internal representation, you already know somehow the segmentation of those. You know which pixels belong to the object in the subpart and which pixels belong to the brand, to the background. If you know this, then once you tie the object with the object components stored in your library, uh, uh, the object representation, then the union of all the object pixels define for you what is the object, uh, uh, what is the full object in the image you're looking at. So you can uh, sort of induce the full um, top-down segmentation based on the limited segmentation that you have for the stored image pieces in your memory. Um, how do you get the segmentation of the images you store in your memory during learning? It turns out that you can do it reliably based by simply on the variability uh, within, and with, uh, within and outside the object region. If you look, for example, at the piece of a horse, you have a segment like this, a patch like this, you look for it in many, many horse images. The actual horse part will be more repeatable. The background will be very variable from image to image. So if you can identify the more repeating part, this is typically the object, and the more variable part, subcomponents are the, uh, the background. So in this way, you can do in learning for the things you have seen before, you train with, you are trained with them, you can produce a reliable segmentation of these uh, components. Using these segmented components, you can now approach a new image, do the recognition, and together with the, the recognition and the segmentation become a mixed process. Once you can identify the uh, uh, local features that give you the correct answer, you can see an image input image, you do the classification based on these patches. The same patches are used for segmentation, you can get a segmentation. So let me not show the result and go to the last part uh, until we break. And then taking a peek at some future challenges, what we cannot do, what I think is cognitively very important, what are really good, I think, open questions for, uh, for the near future. <clears throat> Said that the focus so far was to take images and would take and produce class names. What are the objects uh, in the image? But clearly, in vision, we do much, much more than that. We really get sort of very rich conceptual information. And let me show you some examples. Uh, this is one. What is common to all of these images? What would you say is human observed? 
Yeah, it's good. Say that slightly more loudly. Yeah. What was the answer? Drinking. Drinking. Right. All of these are drinking people. But you can see that the variability is so so large uh, that it goes beyond what happens in object recognition. In object recognition, you, as I said at the beginning, you can expect repeating configurations uh, of repeating elements. So in a car, you have the two wheels and you have the roof and so on. And these kind of features repeat themselves in the same places roughly again and again. When you think about drinking, for example, it's no longer like this. It's really much more variable. And people try, you can train an image, a classifier, with drinking people versus non-drinking people, and you don't get anything reasonable out of it. You can have, you know, men and women and children drinking with the right hand, with the left hand, with both hands, with a cup, with a bottle, it's just endless. You really have to understand that drinking has to do with something more conceptual. Uh, you can see a non-drinking, and the rough configuration can be very similar to what happens in drinking. You can see here sort of non-standard drinking, and we know that all of these are drinking, that are what this boy is doing and what this cat is doing. So we know that all of these are drinking as well. We know drinking has to do some, with something like drinking, bringing liquid to the, to the mouth, and you have to be able to analyze this. And it's not going to be just like the syntax of some patches in the right location. So understanding the activity of people in images uh, it's not just more difficult and more valuable. My own feeling is that it's a different, it's a more complicated problem in a deep conceptual way and will not be solved by just uh, tweaking uh, kind of classifiers. Uh, another important example, which I think is should deserve, started to deserve more and more attention, should deserve more, is understanding how we, how we understand, how we perceive um, interactions between, between people in the world. So it's related to actions. You can say that, I don't know, arguing or hugging is an action, but it's a special kind of an action. It's, the, uh, it's not an action between, it's not a relation between um, an agent and an inanimate object. It's an interaction, it's a relationship between agents. And people have done some psychophysics on things like this. And it turns out that people are at roughly the same time that they can say if they're looking at an airplane or a car, they can say if people were hugging or disagreeing and, and so on. And in this case, again, it would be very difficult to come up with a standard configuration of what you expect, which visual feature you expect well when you have people disagreeing or uh, quarreling. Um, so we don't know what the visual features are, and uh, we're very interested in that. And within this uh, uh, center that uh, uh, is sponsoring this, uh, uh, this meeting, this school here, uh, we're very interested in the computation aspect. And also there is a big effort doing uh, brain studies and fMRI studies on agents' interactions. What happens in the brain when we see people interacting, different types of interaction, uh, where it is in the brain, and so on. Uh, we can go even further when we look at uh, agent interactions. All of these are on the left, so we can say that these are hugging and these people are quarreling. But even if we look at hugging, what would you say is the difference between the top row and the bottom? Any description of what's, what's the difference between these two things? The old hugging, the old instance of hugging, but yeah, so you're laughing. But <laughs> what's the difference? Well, the top row is uh, more of a formal. Exactly. Kind sure. Of it's easy to see. And somebody told yeah, uh, uh, right. Somebody told me politician politicians hearts made. It's uh, so, uh, but it's cordial, not really intimate. It's intimate. <laughs> so we can say not say things not only about the type of interaction, hugging as opposed to quarreling, but about the tone. Is it warm? Is it closed? Is it uh, so just cordial and formal? And the an interesting thing is that this, the tone often comes up to you as a person faster, as fast and sometimes even faster than uh, getting the exact type of interaction. So we know if two people are sort of in a close some positive, intimate interaction or not. People do it in the flesh under very limited viewing conditions. So thinking about 
the visual features for positive interaction, you know, it becomes even more and more um, difficult to conceive what they might be. So I think that developing algorithms and computational schemes that will be able to deal with agent interactions, including both the type uh, and the tone of the inter interaction, will be uh, very interesting. We, uh, in a study that we started, we looked at a number of these interactions. We, we, in addition to taking images from the web, we also worked with professional uh, players and asked them to uh, play a certain episode, like, for example, one person interviewing the other person for a job or something like this. Uh, so one of them was uh, assigned to be the more dominant figure and the other by just by the nature of the task that we assigned to them, and the other one is the more subordinate one. Uh, it's pretty easy to get in short videos, but you can always you can also get many of them in single static images. I think if you had to say on this image on the left, who is the more dominant person, who is the less one, which one would you say is the more dominant, the left or the right? How many think left? <laughs> Anybody thinks right? No, oh, it's true. And I mean, true. We have the ground rules in terms of we told the people that you are the interview. Uh, so, in some of them, it's more difficult. I think here it may be more difficult. Maybe. Okay. For the interest of time, I will not show you the video. It becomes more apparent in the video, even in a short video. It's sort of clear from the motion which one is the more dominant person. It it would be interesting to know. Uh, we know that. Standard classifiers would not work. If you give it images and then you tell it, uh, you know, here is the dominant person, you label it and try new images, it's not working well. It's not clear what exactly the visual features are. Um, and it's known that this comes for people, it's very easy. For people, it also comes out very early. You would be perhaps surprised to know that infants can give you. Uh, uh, some estimation of who is the more important person, who is the more dominant person uh, at the age of nine months or so, they already make some interesting, reliable decisions of who is the dominant person. Yeah. You're driving us crazy. We want to see the video. See if I can. Some reason it's difficult to. What will you say now? It's not easy. I'll play it again. I'll play it again. I'll play it again. I'll play it again. Any guess? Right. Okay, this time it's, very, it's the right person. The, okay, classic one. The person on the left who was very sort of uh, very different before look, the left person is now more proud, submissive. Uh, okay, let <clears throat> the next thing I wanted to skip a little bit and uh, the next thing I wanted to mention is that I think that we have to work, if we want to understand human vision, we have to work on sort of task-guided and task-dependent analysis of images, because unlike the schemes now, they take an image and in a bottom-up they start to work on the pixels and produce basically labeling of the objects in the image. But we can look at images and get a question and then answer it's sort of a Turing test. You can answer arbitrary uh, questions posed about about this image. For example, these are people looking that this is a uh, uh, <clears throat> a person lecturing or giving a talk to a group. And I can ask you: Is everybody looking at the speaker? What would you say? Is everybody looking at the speaker? Yeah. Okay. This is a view from the speaker's podium, looking at the audience in front of them. And is everybody looking at the speaker? No, for example, this person is not. Now, I could ask you, you know, if anyone is uh, having eyeglasses or how many males are in the image. So 
given a single image, I can get you an unbounded set of different questions that could be of interest at any particular uh, situation. And once you're the, the question is posed, you can answer it by looking at the image. And this is very different from what we can do today. And the question of how you can pose the entire, you can guide the entire process of getting information out of the image so that it will get you the right information, know the other things, uh, I think it's something very deep in the same sense that we look at the Turing test as a good test for intelligence of what happens in humans' brains when they have to understand things. I think that if we understand how we can shape and guide the extraction of visual information based on the task at hand, this will be very important. And clearly, we have to immediately decide on a sort of a, an algorithm if we want to know that if everybody is looking at the speaker, we have to do something like find a face, or if we saw a face, find out the next face, test whether this is true, whether the uh, a face is looking at the speaker. If the answer is no, you can stop. Not everybody is looking at the speaker. If the answer is yes, then you have to find the next face and you have to make sure that it's not the face you have seen. And if all the faces are exhausted, you have to say yes. Something like this, you have to, once I give you the, the task, you will have to go in your mind for something like this, uh, compile a certain sequential routine of what is necessary to achieve the goal of this particular one being able to map it to the visual system, to each one of these is now written as a sort of a command, but you have to do some visual processing in order to do it. So you have a query, and then you have to apply some visual routine, visual sequence of operation that will produce the answer. This is one of the things that a group of people here, uh, part of the, so the center is very interested in, in between language and vision, so a query will be posed in, uh, in English, in natural language, will be understood, uh, will be mapped into a set of visual operations that together can give you <coughs> the required uh, information out of the image. So this is language. And then there is some kind of, I think, it's sort of really cognition of mapping it into the right kind of process that will give you the information then apply real vision to it, look for the right features and so on, and then say yes or no, who is looking at the, or any, anything like that. And I wanted to mention briefly that although it's not, this is not usually done in many of the simple object recognition, we know that in, even in simple tasks, very often our extraction of information from the image is shaped in an unconscious way in some kind of a visual routine that applies a sequence of operation and gets an answer. For example, this is from psychophysics we did many years ago, in which people look at it, and the task is not object recognition, but you have to say there are always some lines and some dots, and you have to say if the two red dots are on the same line or not. So here the answer is yes, and the answer is no. And when you ask people how did you do it, they say, well, I looked at it, and it's obvious. Here there are yes, here no. But it turns out if you do it, it turns out that the response time increases linearly. Let's take just the yes answers it increases linearly with the length of the curve between the two red dots. And this was later on tested also physiologically. This is some kind of physiological work, which I will not go into. We show that receptive fields along the trajectory here, uh, along the curve, are activated sequentially. So there's good evidence, both psychophysically and physiologically, that the way we answer this question is that we apply a routine, find the first red dot, maybe it's this one, say this one, then trace the uh, go along the curve, and if it's a long curve, it will take longer. And if you hit the, the second uh, dot, fine, but on the same curve, otherwise they are not. And you will be hard pressed to find sort of visual features, sort of a patch of visual features, just tell you that. And as I mentioned here, it will be interesting if people may try. I mean, I, I think that this is something that may really be worth trying try to train a deep network to distinguish between things like that. This is what, just one example. But something like this that people can do very quickly and will be important for extracting different types of information from the image. The last thing that I would just say a few words about, and that's by, also by the way of introduction to, uh, to the talk by Dan Ferrari later on, a very interesting question for human cognition and intelligence is, is not just to produce a system that 
can do a particular task and how how does it all start? And does it all start? I mean, it's babies. You have an un, unsupervised learning from scratch. You, you're a baby or you're a baby system, baby intelligent computer that you try to build. And you're looking at the world and you see pixels, you see images, and the images change over time. And from the streaming pixels around you, you want to build complete understanding of the world. Uh, and that's what we like to do computationally to, to build a system in which we build in some cap capabilities. We show it months of videos, and after these months, the uh, system has inside some representations of the world around it, in terms of objects and agents and goals and so on. So the same way that people, uh, people, so that's of course a long-term goal. Um, and when I say understanding, it's not just labeling images. For example, here is a difficult action, the action of pouring liquid. So you take something and pour the liquid out of it. So if you think in standard computer vision, then it's a problem of classification. You see examples of pouring, and you have a new image, and you have to say whether there is somebody pouring liquid or something. But if you think about this developmental trajectory and how we get to know, to learn about the world. When we see people pouring liquid, we don't just label new instances of pouring, but we learn about containers and about liquid and about gravity and about flowing from this. All of these concepts become clear and clear to us, and we'd like to be able to learn them uh, from vision. Of course, from babies, they learn not only from vision, they learn from other senses and from manipulation, but clearly vision plays an important part of it. Uh, we people here are interested in the visual part of it would like to know how vision can generate this kind of understanding by watching and then producing, as I said, not only labels, but complete understanding of physical, uh, physical entities like this, the properties and interaction. So let me skip this one. So I think that object recognition is really just a small part of it. We want to deal with rich conceptual domains, with actions, with goals, with social interactions. We want to be able not just to always process an image in the same fixed way, but to be able to extract, to have tasks, and then whenever a task is posed, to be able to fulfill this task or to answer a query about the image and shape the visual uh, process in the way that we uh, produce the right answer uh, and want to use vision in order to use conceptual knowledge in new domain like domain of liquid and, uh, and so on. So we imagine a system in which we make the babies. It applies equally to both cognition and intelligent system. We want in the system some innate capacities that make it all possible and then we want to watch a lot of sensory information and as a result, produce representation and understand, as I said, about goals and tools and social interaction and derived from the uh, um, from the images. Sure. So this is yeah. So just, just let me say this is, of course, a central issue in cognition, and I think it's a very interesting direction for building intelligent systems to do. Uh, as in fact, Turing proposed already his famous uh, Turing uh, Turing test. Paper, it turns out that he actually suggests that maybe the way to build an intelligent system is to build a baby system and to understand learning and then combine the two and rather than produce directly the mature intelligent system and follow human uh, cognitive development and produce uh, an intelligent system this way. Okay, this is a good way to stop. So thank you and you had a question. Uh, yeah, um, I'm just wondering if you you have a, a particular proposal for for the, the sort of like com compiling um, routines for, for answering particular queries. We do, it's a big question, so I cannot uh, I, I cannot give you. Um, I'll say two sentences, and we can take it offline if you are interested more. I think that are repeating mo motifs and repeating patterns if you look at them in the right way. For example, is everybody looking at the at, at the uh, at the speaker? If you look at it, if you try to write sort of a logical formula for it, so you have a relation that looking at, everybody is looking at this, and you ask if there is a unique object, A, such that all the other ones, say the X1 to X, uh, have a particular relation to this uh, uh, 
so the formula will be that there exists an A, which is the listener, such that for all X, X are faces, the relation look at between X and A is fulfilled. Now, if you ask a completely different question, which one is the tallest mark on this table? I can see it's this one here. The existing object A, which is this mark, which all the other ones on the table fulfill the relation taller than. Um, so I think that there are a library of patterns which are more abstract than looking at and so on, which invoke a very similar kind of routine. In this case, go one by one, check for relation, you can stop if there is a violation, and so on. We are thinking in terms of having a library of this relatively abstract type of tasks in ways of mapping particular queries and say, ah, this is uh, this has a natural relation to one of the pre-compiled abstract uh, routine. We think of this as a beginning, and then maybe later on you can put together two of those to create something new. But at the moment, we think about the library of abstract ones, ways of mapping concrete one to abstract one, and then invoking and mapping the, the one you the, the the more abstract one into the one that you have to deal with. Does this make the no sense? Or no? Uh, some of your examples didn't seem like something a dog could do, a visual routine. Do you think the visual routines are uniquely human, or are there other kinds of routines? That it, it's a good question, and I don't know about the, the whole tree of species and so on, but here is an interesting anecdote that I was talking to Herrnstein and his group at Harvard, uh, Ernstein was a very famous pigeon person, and he worked a lot about the cognition of pigeons. And pigeons can recognize faces, and can recognize fish in different types of fishing images, and can do. Ernstein's motto was that pigeons are 95% humans. So he said that whatever humans can do, a pigeon will not do as well. But you train them with food and so on, six months, and they will do it, they will do it eventually. So I asked him about inside outside, which I think is. A dot is either inside the closed curve or outside, which I thought would require the team. And he gave up, trained the pigeon for four months, and he then said, uh, here is a task that pigeons cannot do. So I think pigeons can do fragment-based recognition. They cannot do routines. I'm sure and people have shown it in monkeys, even physiologically, the primates, uh, non-human primates, of course, can do routines. It's a fairly complex one. How, what, what animal can do what? So I think we do have a distinction that certain animals can do very little or none at all, uh, although they have fairly impressive visual cognition in some sense. So I think it's a distinguishing properties between these some species. It's more advanced than uh, things that at least some animals can, even animals with impressive visual capabilities. 